Thanks everyone from, uh, for coming here. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, how to keep hackers out of your clusters with five simple tricks. And obviously it's not going to be five simple tricks. Um, so before we start, I want to pull the room a little bit. Who would identify as someone who's doing mostly security? Security engineering pen tester, right? Um, more on the SRE, DevOps, DevOps engineer side, system engineer. Uh, and more on the application development side, software engineer. Okay, great. Quite a diverse audience. Cool, so thanks for being here today. Um, so the goal and what we try to do today is to start from this stage. So you are you know, someone who has to run applications in Kubernetes and you want to make sure that whenever someone asks you to secure it, uh, you don't feel like this, but you have instead, uh, you know, that you can feel confident and you know uh, how to prioritize things and that instead you can feel like that. My name is uh, Christophe, I'm uh, French as you can hear. I live in Switzerland and I work at Datadog at focusing on uh, cloud security and open source. I'm the maintainer of a few open source projects. One is called the Stratus Red Team, another one is called the Managed Kubernetes Auditing Toolkit. And this is Fred. Hi, I'm Fred. Uh, I'm senior security researcher at Datadog, mainly focusing on threat intelligence, malware analysis, and uh, yeah, threat activities. Great, so on the agenda we have mostly three things. The first one is we're going to do a bit of threat modeling of Kubernetes. It sounds like a swear word, but it's going to be fine, don't worry. And then we're going to look at, uh, Fred is going to tell us a bit at, okay, the first one is the theoretical side, but then what do we see in the wild? What do we see in the real world? How are attackers actually doing things? And finally, based on that, we're going to say, well, these are the things that make sense to implement because uh, they are actually valuable. We are making two assumptions. The first one is that we are using managed Kubernetes running in the cloud, so uh, EKS, AKS, or GKE, uh, just because you know, it's a different level of abstraction and it allows us to say, for instance, that ETCD is going to be secure and we don't need to care about that. Who's using managed Kubernetes in one of the major clouds? Okay, many people. Not everyone, but it will still be relevant uh, if you are using your own on your Raspberry Pi. So, <laughs> threat modeling. Um, again, if we want a bad user story to start with, it's just that as someone who defends something, I need to be able to understand what are the attacks, right? Uh, because you cannot secure what you can defend. And I think the best way to do that is to know how to attack it. Um, and it's a few things. So mostly looking at what are the entry points? You know, what are, uh, where are uh, the, I mean, how is your data flowing through this cluster? Uh, what are you, um, where is the network and things like that? And there are two challenges, I think, is how do you choose the right abstraction level? So if we are using managed Kubernetes, we don't want to look at all the control plane and how to secure that. Uh, things like ETD, Core DNS, uh, because they are handled for us. And also, how do we prioritize the different attacks that we see? So this is, let's say, the standard, the standard use case, way simplified, of course. So we have the cloud provider. On top of it, we run worker nodes, uh, typically EC2, things like that. On top of this, we have pods, and we have the Kubernetes API on the left that is managed by the cloud provider. So in terms of traffic flows, we have mostly three things. The management traffic on the left, that is um, who, I mean, the traffic that goes to the Kubernetes API. On the right, we have the data plane traffic, so this is more uh, traffic that goes to the applications. If you have web services, that's the HTTP or gRPC traffic. And on the top right, we have the traffic that goes to the container image registry. When you run a pod, it's going to pull the image, um, I mean, the kubelet is going to run, uh, to pull the image from a registry. How do we attack that? Well, there are a few ways. The first one is to exploit a vulnerability in one of the application. Maybe you are uh, going to exploit a Java application that has a vulnerable log4j version or something like that. Um, and then as the attacker, you are inside the pod, right? So you can do a few things from there. You can try to escape to the host. So typically, this is if you have a vulnerability in uh, the Linux kernel, in the container runtime, or a pod that is dangerously configured. You can also try to steal cloud credentials, and we'll see that in a bit, but uh, typically, in many cases, you can actually uh, steal credentials from the underlying worker node using the instance metadata service from your cloud. This is applicable to uh, AWS, uh, GCP, and Azure. And finally, if the pod had some permissions, if it's running under a service account that has a cluster role or a role uh, bound to it, then you can probably steal the service account token and move to the Kubernetes API. 
if you are able also to compromise someone like the credentials of an admin that uh, can access the cluster, you can also directly hit the Kubernetes API. And finally, if you are able to poison one of the images that's used in production, well, you can also run some code in the cluster. So that's the minimalistic uh, threat model that we we'll use today. And the goal is really to say, okay, these are, in theory, what can happen, and what do we see in reality? Um, when we say threat model, I think it's also interesting to look at what are the, um, how, what are the techniques that the community thinks exist to attack a cluster. Um, so there is something that's called the Kubernetes Threat Matrix by Microsoft, and it basically tries to split uh, the way that you can attack something into multiple steps. So the first column is initial access, which is how can you initially hack basically a cluster. Then you have things like persistence, this is how do you backdoor something and privilege escalation, etc. And each of the, um, the items in this table is uh, one attack that is possible to perform. And the question is therefore, you know, um, what is theoretical and what is something that we should actually care about? And there's an image that, yeah, that we see here. Um, something in the Kubernetes threat matrix, for instance, tells you, well, if an attacker is able to create a malicious admission controller, they can uh, backdoor all of your pods and do some malicious things, which is true. But is it something that we should actually care about or is it just something that is more theoretical and, um, and that's it? So, Fred, you are a researcher. Can you tell us a little bit what you researched and, and what you found as well? Yes, thanks. So, before deep diving into uh, what we have observed so far, uh, we will just introduce a small concept about threat-informed defense. So, the idea here is to uh, know your enemy, so uh, against who you are fighting and defending, in fact. So, in order to do that, uh, you have to gather all uh, the different information, uh, which we call the threat intelligence. So you, you want to know about the different attacker groups, what are their techniques, tactics, and procedures, as uh, shown in the uh, Kubernetes threat matrix, uh, but also the different type of threat activities, and of course, the new vulnerabilities, which are released uh, mostly every day and, all, and then. And in a, once you have a good definition of uh, this uh, information, then you can put in place some security mechanism. So this is basically what Kate would like to do. Uh, however, there are some limits as well for threat, uh, threat informed defense, especially for cloud and containers. So, at first, threat intelligence should not should drive prioritization, but should not be an end goal by itself. And regarding the threat intelligence information, so uh, you have some dedicated feeds uh, which exist on the, the internet, but they are not always curated, I would say, but there's also some um, initiative uh, from the open source community, and there was also a talk this morning uh, about that, so we mentioned it uh, later in, uh, in the slide, uh, about uh, building uh, an open source threat intelligence for uh, Kubernetes as well. And uh, yeah, so this is also a lack of uh, uh, threat intelligence for uh, cloud and containers. So this is the presentation I was just mentioning. So uh, at least, yeah, you can uh, get uh, all the, the information directly here. So here are our contribution for the talk. Uh, so we did some literature review, uh, reading different security research blog posts, uh, also uh, yeah, checking all the known uh, exploited vulnerabilities in the wild. So for example, you have the CISA, uh, which is uh, an American uh, um, agencies uh, which public, uh, public, uh, yeah, release the different uh, exploited vulnerabilities seen in the wild in real world attacks. So this is uh, yeah, quite interesting to, to take into account. Uh, but also different research papers and of course uh, vendor reports that uh, you can uh, have pretty yeah, every year uh, talking about the different trends that they have uh, observed in the uh, customer telemetry. The second contribution that we have, uh, it's uh, based on our uh, own observation, thanks to our honeypots. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so at first, what is a honeypot? So honeypot is um, a voluntary vulnerable service that you will expose on the internet uh, to mimic uh, a specific service and uh, yeah, to lure attacker and uh, try to get uh, lots of information from the, yeah, the, what they will do once they have a foothold on your honeypot directly. So we de deployed several ones. Uh, we have a, what we call a honeynet, 
So it's uh, fully automated uh, with the CI/CD infrastructure as code and so on. We have deployed our own ONNet directly in uh, four different regions in AWS. Uh, and with uh, all the monitoring uh, needed to uh, be sure that, uh, yeah, we don't get compromised as well. Uh, and then um, we get all the different logs, information, and we uh, created uh, our uh, own epot workflow. So on the left, you have the attacker uh, trying to connect to our fake Kubernetes API server. We grab all the different logs thanks to uh, the Kubernetes uh, uh, audit logs uh, directly into data logs. And then uh, on the right, we have the threat intelligence platform, uh, which will grab and gather, aggregate all this type on, of information uh, based on uh, an open source project called Yeti, so your everyday threat intelligence. Uh, and then uh, we try to build um, some sort of campaign. So this is the notion uh, that are mentioned in the, the paper we, uh, we discussed uh, earlier with the sticks, uh, formats, and so on. So the idea is to define the campaign based, for example, here, on the Docker image, uh, the, command, the command we have seen, but we could also take into account the different environment variable and so on. And then we just slack notif about the new campaigns and we, just, and we then analyze further uh, the different payload. As you can see here, we have some base 64 uh, payloads and so on, which uh, resolve to uh, more payloads uh, that will be downloaded directly onto your workload. And so for Kubernetes, what we did, we created Quokbot. So it's based on Quok, which is a Kubernetes without Kubelet. So the idea is just to provide uh, all the functionalities of the Kubernetes API server without uh, the final payload uh, running the, the pods and so on. And uh, as you can see, we can get lots of different uh, information about uh, what's going on uh, when you expose a, a voluntary vulnerable uh, Kubernetes server. Cool, so that's the how. Maybe you can tell us a bit about uh, you know, what you found, and also we're going to split that into multiple categories. Uh, so we're going to split that against, sorry, between what we saw against the control plane, so what directly tries to hit the Kubernetes API server, versus what tries to exploit a, a workload that happens to be in Kubernetes. Um, so Fred, the first thing that you want to tell us is that when you expose something to the internet, it gets scanned and exploited very fast. Yes, exactly. So. Once you deploy something directly uh, on the internet, exposed directly on the internet, you will be scanned by default uh, from different uh, web services and companies just to uh, map the internet and get information of, of what is exposed directly. So here you have an example for Kubernetes, uh, our Kubernetes on iPod. So as you can see, we have different probes, so mainly coming from the US, but uh, yeah, from uh, all over the world. So that's one part. Then. Uh, you can uh, also, yeah, by default, scan, be scanned by uh, uh, some specific web services like Census, Shodan, and so on. So what they are doing, they are just running scanners uh, around, yeah, on, around all the IPv4 address space, but IPv6 as well, to uh, know about the different threats we have, uh, uh, the different exposed services we have uh, on the internet. So on the left, this is the results from our Honeypot. So as you can see, you have the user agent, uh, based, uh, which is named Census directly. So they are not just trying to know if you uh, just uh, expose uh, uh, open ports, but they are more aggressive and getting more details about uh, your uh, cluster itself. So as you can see, the different uh, uh, services, roles, nodes, etc. Et and then in the end, on the right, this is the Census uh, web service where you just query uh, something uh, that could interest you. So for example, uh, how many uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, pod names uh, we have uh, exposed directly on the internet, and uh, yeah, you have directly the results. So basically, this is what attackers are also doing for the reconnaissance phases when they want to uh, uh, directly uh, attack your company, for example. Then you have also the um, uh, different, uh, yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, then you also have the different command line that uh, you will uh, use by default when uh, you are on a Kubernetes cluster to know what uh, your permission, what's possible to do. So this is one example here. You can see that they are trying to, to know if they can create pods, create uh, different nodes, services, deployment, and so on. We also have the same thing for the listing. So the idea here is to, uh, yeah, to know what's running here. And finally, uh, you can also uh, have some more uh, uh, yeah, attackers trying to get directly all your, secret, all your secrets. 
So this brings us to the cloud credential. Yeah, so one thing to remember is that we made the assumptions that the cluster runs in the cloud, which means that the cluster is only as secure as the cloud. Um, and typically, the way that you can use that is um, when you compromise a cloud identity, so typically an IAM user or things like that, you can access the cluster by design. And we know that IAM user access keys typically are very easy to leak. Uh, these are a few examples. And we did some research actually last year and we showed that uh, most of the cloud incidents are caused by some cloud credentials that leak. And this happens all the time. This is an example from Virus Bulletin. It's a, a conference, uh, a security conference. And this is a presentation from someone uh, that runs an incident response team. They showed an incident where they had an IAM user compromised. This is the guard duty alert that they had. And then uh, you can see in this piece of cloud trail log, this is the AWS control plane logs, that the attacker tries to use the AWS CLI uh, to access the cluster. So uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that once you compromise a pod that runs in the cloud, it's actually super easy most of the time to get some credentials for the underlying worker node. Um, so that's one way. But typically, you know, when you attack a pod and you, and you manage to compromise it, you, you're going to try three things as an attacker. First one is to hit what is called the instance metadata service. Uh, this is what's going to give you some, some cloud credentials for the worker node. And this is unfortunately working by default for, uh, for many cases. Um, you can try to look at hard-coded credentials on the file system. Also, it happens a lot. And look at environment variables. Uh, that's the, the theory, but in practice, this is a sample script that, uh, that we caught. You can see the first line is a list of files that the attacker is trying to target. And they are basically files that look like they could contain AWS credentials. The second and, and uh, third line in this uh, get AWS info function is the attacker trying to hit the instance metadata service with curl to say, well, give me some security credentials uh, and these are going to, to, to give you uh, the, the credentials for the underlying worker nodes I am role. Finally, you can see that they are trying to, uh, to steal these credentials and to send them to basically a backend that they control. And in that case, funnily enough, if you just went to this slash PHP deal, you could actually find all the credentials that they uh, stole, uh, as you can see here. So uh, we were able to report that to AWS and they just were able to revoke all these keys. I want to touch a bit also on container escape vulnerabilities. So this is really, you manage to hack a pod, you're inside the pod you, and you can run commands. Um, what do you do to escape outside of this pod? If you read the abstract of this presentation, we said we were going to talk about this and how they are used in the wild. Uh, and the reality is that there is very little documentation of a container escape being used in the wild, uh, which to me was very uh, su surprising. And I think there are a few reasons. The first one, and this is from a paper from a few years ago, uh, but it still remains true, is that there aren't that many container escape vulnerabilities in container runtimes. Uh, so this is an example for the most popular ones. You have only four critical vulnerabilities, three of them, being pro, three of them having proof of concept. So the attack surface isn't that, uh, that wide. And the second reason that uh, these are two pretty well-known red teamers that are saying, like, do I actually need, oh, so you don't see it. Uh, they are saying, do you actually need to do a container escape if you can do easier things, right? If you can just steal cloud credentials and go after your S3 bucket that have some credit cards, it's much easier. Uh, and the second reason being that you first need to have access to a pod for that, so you need a vulnerable application. And this is harder these days than it was maybe 10 years ago. That said, if you don't have plans for this weekend, um, there is the pool to own concept, sorry, contest happening in Vancouver. And they explicitly said for the first time that they will give you $60,000 if you find a container escape in container D or Firecracker. So if you, if you don't have plans for the weekend, think about it. And we might see some new vulnerabilities that come out of this. Um, so that's something to watch out for. Fred, next you want to tell us that attackers are trying to create workloads. So what does it mean? Are they like trying to create their own microservices or something? Yeah, so as they basically fail to directly create or escape from host, what they are basically doing is just creating new workloads. 
So there's different ways to, uh, to create the workload, so with the different final objective. So for one, you can uh, create new workload just to escalate privileges by creating the privilege pods and just mounting the host file system directly into your pods and get access to everything you want. And so you have some uh, example here about the different execution. So just creating different pods, but also daemon sets directly in the different namespace, so cube system, but also the default as well. And they also like to bring their own images. So these images uh, are all host uh, on Docker Hub. So most of them are now deleted because we uh, reported them uh, as malicious. But yeah, basically they just create their, their own uh, workload with their own images, with their own tooling uh, directly available inside the, the workload itself, the, the, the image itself. Uh, another thing to know as well is that attacker exploit vulnerable software as well, so this is part of the game. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so attackers exploit public facing vulnerabilities most of the time to get an initial foothold into your uh, containers, so that's part of the data plane. So here you have the top five vulnerabilities exploited in the wild uh, based on 2023 and uh, ba uh, yeah, based on the report of uh, Aqua. Uh, but yeah, they also uh, create a new, uh, yeah. <laughs> they also uh, unroll a compromised host to scan the internet itself. So what they are doing basically, so that's another payload we, we, ca we caught directly in our honeypots. Uh, once they have a foothold in your uh, workload, they will try, they will use the workload itself to scan the internet and try to exploit new hosts and, uh, yeah, compromise them as well. And uh, as you can see here, so this one is uh, coming from a, a remote code exploitation uh, vulnerability in Confluence, and they are just using uh, open source projects like MassScan, ZGrab, and so on to just, yeah, uh, scanning the internet in some specific uh, IP ranges as well. So as you can see, uh, we covered, thanks to the literature, but also our honeypots, uh, different parts of the Kuberne uh, Microsoft Kubernetes threat matrix. But now we would like to know how can we uh, prevent attackers uh, yeah, getting a foothold in our uh, Kubernetes cluster. So Christophe, can you please tell us more on this? Yes. Uh, so again, these are all the attacks that we were able to find either publicly documented, either from our honeypots, uh, mapped to the uh, Microsoft Kubernetes threat matrix that we showed before. Now this is all good and shiny, but how do we, you know, what do we do, right? Um, and so my, my question is, first, should we try to secure our control plane? So do we make our Kubernetes API more secure or our data plane? And the answer, which is kind of obvious, is that you need both. Uh, because if you, if you secure your Kubernetes API, but you run your workloads as admin exposed to the internet with some vulnerabilities, your security looks like this. And conversely, if you are just uh, securing your workloads, but you have your Kubernetes API on the internet without authentication, it's not going to end well either, right? So um, the first thing, the first advice uh, would be to get the control plane basics right. And the good news is that you're in the cloud in a managed Kubernetes server uh, service, so you don't need to really manage your cloud control plane. Um, uh, you just need to make sure that authentication is enforced on the API server, which is the default and it's actually very hard to disable that, which is good. Uh, one advice is to, disable, is to minimize the network exposure of the API server. So your API server makes sure that if you can, you can either put it on a private network, either add some IP allow listing on that. On GCP, you have something called the, um, the identity aware proxy, which makes this quite easy. On AWS, most likely you're going to need to put that on an internal network uh, or to use a bastion host or to use IP allow listing. I think one also piece of advice is use as little Kubernetes as you need. So obviously, if we don't need Kubernetes, we don't, we, we don't use it. Uh, but many times, we actually don't even need to manage the nodes, in which case using something like GKE Autopilot or AWS EKS on Fargate is great because you have no control over the nodes, so you, you don't have to patch the nodes you, and you are protected against various, uh, various vulnerabilities and things that are quite bad, so that's good. And otherwise, if you need the full power of Kubernetes and to manage the nodes, manage Kubernetes is a good option. And obviously, if you have a full engineering team which can manage your control plane, uh, that's one option maybe. The second piece of advice um, is to make sure that you can block the cloud metadata service from the pods. So you have pods, and the pods, they have different ways of accessing 
cloud credentials, but they shouldn't be able to use the instance metadata service. Uh, typically, the way that this is attacked is you have an attacker that compromises a pod, and from this pod, they steal cloud credentials that belong to the instance role uh, that they run on. As a very quick demo, it's going to go fast, and I, I, I know it's 5 p.m., but uh, on the left, I have an application that's vulnerable to command injection, and you see on the left an attacker that's going to compromise it, on the right, going to run some malicious commands, and they are doing curl on the instance metadata service and getting back some credentials that belong to the underlying worker node. Once more time, um, I'm running a malicious command in this vulnerable application. I do curl 169.254.169.254, and I can basically get some um, credentials for the instance. And from there, I can do various bad things. Uh, if you are interested, last year I gave a, a presentation with Diego Comas from Sourcegraph about specifically these attack vectors. So uh, how you can do different kinds of bad stuff in a managed Kubernetes environment. So if you want to check it out, um, the slides will be online, of course. But what you need to do, so two things. If you are using GKE, you need to enable workload identity, uh, which is enabled by default on GKE Autopilot. And on AWS or Azure, you need to explicitly block the access with a network policy. That's the long story short. Now, again, we're in the cloud. It's not, you know, it's a normal thing for workloads to access the cloud. And typically, there are secure ways to do that, like EKS pod identity on AWS or IAM roles for service accounts. So these are secure mechanisms through which your Java, your Go application can get some access to your cloud environment. Uh, but I think it's super important to be aware of what kind of access they have and to know, you know, if you have thousands of pods, which ones can basically be used to go after your cloud. So one way to do that uh, is an open source project that we released last year, which is called the Managed Kubernetes Auditing Toolkit, uh, MCAT, which looks at your Kubernetes service accounts. It looks at your AWS roles and it's going to uh, generate something like this which shows you you have this pod in this namespace that can take this IAM role. Again, by design, but it's good to be aware of that, and you might get some, some surprises as well. The, the fourth piece of advice is just to be intentional about what can run in, in the cluster. Uh, so if, uh, if you see it with your team, with your SRE team, probably they will tell you things like, oh, we don't run some images from, from the Docker Hub because uh, we get some rates, limits, and things like that, which is good for security as well. Uh, what's important is to try to be able to, to codify that and to be able to either block, either get some alerts when a workload that you don't want in your cluster tries to get created. Uh, so these are things like privileged pods or pods that mount the whole file system. Probably you don't want to have a pod that can mount the root file system of the host in its CMP folder. Uh, so, you know, first step is to try to do some alerting, second one to block it. A few ways to do that. Uh, so, there is Open Policy Agent Gatekeeper. You have Kyverno. There are two kinds of admission controller. And you have a relatively new feature in Kubernetes, which is called Pol Security Admission, which allows you to do some of that, including since recently with some custom rules that you can write as, I think, as custom resource definitions. The presentation I, I have below here is from a colleague, an ex-colleague, uh, Tommy McCormick. He showed how at Datadog, in the compute security team, they were able to use uh, OPA gatekeeper for this. And the fifth piece of advice is that it's actually very boring, but application security matters. Like many of it, much of the time, uh, the way an attacker is going to get into your cluster is through an application. So all the standard piece of advice applies. Uh, this is a great talk from Clint Gibler. He writes the TLDRSec newsletter. Uh, so, you know, things like use a framework, don't try to reinvent session management, things like that, and try to be aware that, you know, if you use Java 8, it's probably going to need to update, uh, but also to look at the libraries, the dependencies, if you are using a supported version of the framework, things like that, that tend to align with a good maturity of op operations anyway. Now, once you've done all of that, you can try to go to the next level. Uh, but personally, I think it's confusing because sometimes someone will tell you that what Fred is going to show is going to make you hacked, and I don't think that's true. So, you know, these are the kind of basics that make sense to cover first, and then you have some more options. Yes, so you're right. At first, you need to cover the five simple tricks, and then you can go to the next level. So the first one would be, for example, to harden your workload. So you have different ways to do it. So the first one would be, for example, 
to uh, very carefully choose the image you would like to run into your container. So for example, uh, distroless uh, stuff, but also just Python images. If you just need to run Python uh, code, why would you install directly fetch um, uh, Ubuntu images, for example? So that's one first way. So that uh, at least you do not uh, integrate what uh, attackers are user, uh, usually uh, using once they have the foothold on the, on the container, like curl, yget, apt. They are also doing apt install directly. So that's the first step. Then you can also have, add uh, some security context, so either directly at the pod level, but also at the container by uh, uh, adding the read-only root file system. Uh, so setting it to true will prevent, for example, uh, the, um, the attacker to be able to fetch another payload to execute them and so on, but also to put in place some uh, persistent mechanism. Uh, you can also disable all privilege uh, escalation, so this uh, will prevent the running process to uh, get a higher privilege uh, in, inside the container, so they won't be able to sudo uh, stuff like that, for example. And finally, uh, to disable uh, running as root as well. Uh, then you can also implement a runtime threat detection blocking. Oh yes, thanks. Uh, so, by using uh, open source projects as well, so such as Falco, uh, Tetragon, or Tracy, so they all rely on eBPF to monitor the, your workload, and uh, then you can be notified as well of what's going on uh, on uh, the different uh, part of your cluster. And finally, uh, you can also proactively uh, identify attack paths directly in your cluster. So that's an, another open source project we released uh, a few months ago, which is Qbound. Uh, the idea behind the project is to, uh, uh, from a container, uh, how can I become cluster admin just by, by uh, exploiting the different privileges associated to uh, my, uh, wor my workloads. And then uh, the hardcore, hardcore mode. Uh, so you can also put in place some Aparmor, AC Linux, uh, SecComp uh, profiles as well. And also, for example, take into account image signature and uh, also provenance. And that brings us to the conclusion. Yeah, that was a lot. Um, so to conclude a bit, a few key takeaways. First one is that whenever we try to secure anything, the first thing, in my opinion, is to try to understand how you can attack it and to do some basic threat modeling. That's really helpful. Uh, but knowing what attackers do is great to help to prioritize. But if you only rely on that, you're going to change your security strategy every week. So it's not good either. The first thing is that there is not much in terms of threat intelligence for cloud and for containers. Uh, so this is probably going to get better, but it's something to be aware of. And finally, that some security mechanisms are worth it, and some of them are much harder to implement and the value is a bit more questionable. So uh, that's all for today. This is the QR code that you cannot leave the room without scanning. Uh, if you like the presentation, please uh, tell us so. If you didn't, please tell us so. And um, if you know the TLDRSEC newsletter, there will be a blog post version of this presentation tomorrow, so if you prefer to read it um, or to transfer it, this is a good way. Thank you very much.